Okay, well, good evening all and welcome to the March 16th meeting, uh, 2021 meeting of the Growth Planning Committee. I'm Dan Saunders. Uh, we'll um, go around and introduce everyone. Warner? Warner Gilliam. Yeah. Janet? Janet Powell. Paul? Paul Hogan here. All right. And then uh, Tom? Tom Morgan. And Liz. Liz Durfee. All right. Uh, anyone else? I don't see anyone else on the participant page. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, so we're going to start off today's agenda with the hazard mit mitigation chapter. So who's providing that? You, Liz? I will be sharing my screen. Yep. Okay. So let me just pull that up. Perfect. Is that house the one on Langsford Road you have pictured there, or is that one of the fish houses? Question. Are you talking to me? I think that opening picture is the, um, what's her name? Linda Weir. I'm sorry, I have her wrong name. That, yeah. Langsford Road, or? Yeah, um, that's the yeah. one on Langsford Road. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, I think actually Tom and I went out independently taking photos back in the beginning of our project and we both ended up with this very mm -hmm. similar photo of this house, if I'm remembering correctly. You do, yeah. It's, it was a good sign. We were taking pictures of the same thing. So yeah. <laughs> that was <laughs> encouraging. Yeah. Um, so I'll get started with the review of uh, Chapter 16, Hazard Mitigation, and uh, it's not a very long chapter, as uh, you likely noticed if you had a chance to skim through it. This chapter uh, includes a few um, references and some a little bit of information pulled out of the York County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, it's not intended to be uh, redundant of that information or obviously replace the hazard mitigation plan, but just focus a, a little bit more on a couple uh, coastal hazards and uh, provide a few maps uh, to sort of supplement that hazard mitigation plan and um, highlight some of the, the items that are more land use planning relevant. So in addition to um, those references to the to the county plan. Um, there is a map of critical facilities and evacuation routes. The, there is a section on coastal hazards, uh, climate change, and uh, other natural hazards, a short section on pandemics, and, um, and then the land use planning objectives from the 2015 hazard mitigation plan. This photo, I should say, is from, I believe it was from January 20th, um, around then. Um, actually, no, it wasn't January 20th. It must have been de in December um, when we were in town on a rainy day during high tide. So as defined by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, Natural hazard mitigation planning is a process used by state, tribal, and local governments to engage stakeholders, identify hazards and vulnerabilities, develop the long-term strategy to reduce risk and future losses, uh, and implement the plan. Preparing a hazard mitigation plan also helps the community increase um, education and awareness on natural hazards, get input from the community on um, particular hazards and vulnerabilities, um, build partnerships to reduce uh, the impact of um, hazards on businesses, <clears throat> business continuity structures uh, in the public, identify strategies for risk reduction, uh, identify cost-effective mitigation actions, um, integrate planning efforts, and re reduce risk um, and uh, overall improve coordination with regard to hazard mitigation. Um, so the, that's sort of what your the county the countywide hazard mitigation plan 
um, is intended to accomplish. And um, in addition to um, helping the town qualify for uh, funding for, <clears throat> excuse me, for hazard mitigation. I mentioned that the 2015 hazard mitigation plan is the most current plan. The plans are typically up, updated every five years and approved by um, the state and, uh, and FEMA. The, the York County plan uh, in this last 2015 version focused on four key uh, hazards that I've listed up here, severe winter storms, floods, severe summer storms, and wildfire. And under those main categories, they do include um, dam failure, coastal erosion, and landslides under the flooding heading. Tornadoes, hurricanes, and tropical storms are included as severe summer storms. And um, wildfire includes um, forest fires and then also hazards um, that are uh, in the what's called the urban wild interface, um, which is basically urban areas that abut uh, more rural areas. And I'm I was curious if anyone's actually, I'm, I'm guessing Werner has participated in the processes of updating the uh, hazard mitigation plan. I know that the processes that I've been involved in have been for the preparation of municipal plans, not countywide plans. Um, but I imagine that there has been an opportunity for um, planning board members and other members of the community to get involved in the preparation of the, the county plan. Has that been your experience? Uh, so, uh, no, it actually, that that hasn't been my experience. I, you know, I, I wasn't involved in any, you know, in any work related to the to the county uh, oh. hazard mit mitigation plan. I mean, there were there were a couple of meetings, you know, that were well attended by your county EMA, uh, but it wasn't specifically related to you know updates and the creation of. Uh, the mitigation plans. Uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that we didn't have town representation as part of it. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, ta the town has an EMA director uh, that would have been heavily involved with any of those updates. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. The in the processes that I've been involved in, they're very um, heavily focused on getting entities. Uh, multiple entities from the municipality and the public involved with actually identifying the hazards and um, coming up with mitigation strategies. So that's um, that's an interesting difference. And I think um, I'm curious about how some of the land use planning objectives align with sort of the town's goals for hazard mitigation. So we'll get there at the end. Um, yeah, to your point, no, the hazard mitigation chapter in the previous plan was, you know, was relatively, you know, was a relatively short plan, you know, and I would say that it's, it seemed like it, it focused more on, you know, evacuation uh, and immediate, you know, immediate response type, uh, type strategies. The, the section of the comp plan or the, the 2010 hazard mitigation plan? Yeah, I think the 2010 hazard mitigation yeah. plan. Yeah. I didn't take a look at that one. Um, but um, thanks, that's that's good input. Um, I didn't see too many maps in the hazard mitigation plan and I did find um, one resource uh, that was produced in 2016 um, by um, the planning commission that uh, Southern Maine um, Planning and Development Commission that uh, is called the Evacuation Route Signs and Emergency Shelters Report. Um, and it was prepared by um, the commission and the York Emergency Management Agency. And it identified some of the key uh, evacuation routes, which I've highlighted in red here, um, the portions that are in, in the vicinity of Kennebunk Port. And it also had a section um, talking about um, signage for evacuation routes. Um, and I corresponded with the um, emergency management director in Kennebunkport, and he 
had indicated that there, that there is some signage um, along Route 9. One of the things that stuck out to me in the report was the fact that um, no, they identified that there are very few east-west routes that are identified in, in many coastal areas in southern Maine. Um, and as you can see here in Kennebunk Port, and they also highlighted the fact that two of the primary evacuation <clears throat> routes, Route 1 and um, 95, um, which the, the label is just sticking off the screen here. Um, those routes run, um, as you know, fairly north-south and uh, along the coast. And their proximity to the, co to the coastline um, means that that if you're traveling on Route 1 or even 95 to get away from a severe coastal hazard, you may not be traveling to a safer location. Um, so the need to look at um, moving farther inland if there is a major coastal, um, coastal event um, where there are um, impacts in multiple communities, you may not want to be traveling south on Route 1, um, which would bring you even closer to um, areas that are potentially impacted by a, a natural hazard or at least congested by people um, evacuating from those areas. And then in Kenny Bunkport, it, it may be worth considering um, identifying some alternate routes for folks to, uh, to exit the community and, and travel particularly to the Kenny Bunk Middle School, which is the identified emergency shelter for the municipality. So thinking about how if, if a mass amount of people did need to travel uh, away from the coast, um, or for that matter, any region in Kennebunk Port to the middle school, um, how would they travel? And, and how would people know which way is the, um, the recommended route for traveling? The Kennebunk Middle School shelter has a capacity um, of about 150 to 200 people. Um, and that middle school, uh, there is an agreement between Kennebunk, Kennebunk Port and Arundel to use that shelter. And that, um, that capacity is during non-COVID time. So if the shelter was needed um, during a situation like we're experiencing now, um, the, the capacity would be uh, likely diminished at that shelter. So it may be um, appropriate for us to also look at other potential shelter areas that could be used as shelters um, when we're going through the, um, the process of uh, developing strategies. One thing, oh, sorry, one thing I was thinking is that this might be um, a good question for another mini survey to ask uh, where people, if people know where they would travel in the event of emergency, would they leave the state to, um, or leave the municipality to um, shelter with friends or family? Would they um, have readily available transportation to evacuate? Um, questions of that nature <clears throat> might be interesting to ask. I imagine a lot of people do have family and friends that they could stay with, but um, I think it's a, um, it might be a good question to pose since there are um, even minor storm events that could knock out power for a few days and, um, and drive the need to, um, to shelter in another location. Can I ask a question, Liz? Yeah. So what determines, you know, how they pick evac routes? Because I'm just looking at it, you know, and, and it's, it's a question I honestly, I don't know the answer to it because, you know, I look at the, you know, all the routes and I mean, they're identified state routes, but, you know, I think, you know, given kind of what we're potentially dealing with, you know, having, you know, having route nine cut down through dock square and crossing the river, doesn't necessarily seem like the best and only, you know, evac route, you know, depending on what the, you know, what the situation is, depending on what type of an event, you know, the town is dealing with. So I was just curious as to what was the, 
if you knew what what you know what the criteria was because it just it looks here like we just have identified uh, state roads. I I can try to get some more information from um, maybe from the emergency management agency, um, the the York emergency management agency on that. I'm not sure exactly how those were an identified, um, but I do agree that it, you know it appears that the state roads were chosen and um, uh, they don't necessarily represent the um, the best routes. There's there's quite a few river crossings, for example, um, you know, all along Route 9 um, that, that could be um, inaccessible. I know that when I've worked with communities on um, talking about evacuation, they have worked on choosing roads that are potential routes um, within the municipality and not necessarily using um, designated evacuation routes um, that maybe the, the state has identified or another entity is more um, an internal process. Hmm. So if there are, um, you know, particular routes that, um, for example, that, you know, become inaccessible during a flood um, and or are congested like Dock Square, then those would be routes to maybe identify some some alternatives to. Yeah, I mean, in a mad rush, the last thing you would do is head into Dock Square. Right. Uh, right. With the tide was coming up particularly. If right. From the eastern part of town, you know, you'd probably go out, um, you know, goose somehow get to Log Cabin Road and go across Route 1 if, we, right. if you needed to uh, evade Route 1. But I suspect a lot of people would not know what to do once they got to Route 1 or crossed Route 1, particularly seasonal people. They don't know where those roads go. Um, but you'd certainly, you know, from the whole eastern end of town, that's really the only way out. You know, heading to Biddeford probably doesn't make any sense. Yeah either uh yeah right right yeah, goose yeah Rock, i mean goose rocks road to log cabin mm -hmm. that's right yeah and, right. and old you'd use old cape road you know old yeah. cape and old cape and goose rocks road yeah. would be your your east west i right. guess if you want to call them that east west routes it's really log cabin road is kind yeah. of right. yeah the best and I think the other piece is um, making sure that folks know, especially I think Paul, you had a good point about um, the fact that seasonal residents may not know how to get out. I mean, most people have access to a smartphone, um, but, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, maybe their battery's dead or something. Signage may be important, um, and folks may um, distributing information in advance may may be important. Hmm. So folks have an I idea think, of where to go. Maybe putting together a basic map, something like that. I think as a survey question, it's a good education tool just to get people to think about it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I that's what I was thinking. Before. I mean, I would, yeah, I, I try to put myself in that position if I had to leave. And, you know, my sister who's nearby, her house also lost power. Like, who would the next person that I would go to be? And, um, you know, for folks who don't have a vehicle, um, rely on public transportation, um, that, you know, it, it may be more problematic, and so thinking about how how those folks can um, can safely evacuate, whether or not there's a public transportation in in an emergency, that sort of thing is is pretty critical. Werner, do you know like whether um, you know our power outages is our most common, you know, where we could lose power for five days or something like that? Has the middle school ever opened? In those circumstances, you know, uh, it has. Yes, 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know it, it has, it has opened in, in some of those situations where, you know, we've had sections of town, you know, where there hasn't been any power, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a good location for it, for sure. You know, you've got fire department over there, um, you know, a number of other different buildings, um, you know, plenty of backup power over in those locations. And I'm sure that's a big part of the criteria, you know, plenty of parking. I, I live um, 13 miles from a nuclear power plant, and um, the operator of the plant is required by the federal government to um, notify everybody in that radius once a year what the best evacuation routes are. So mm -hmm. they, it arrives in the mail disguised as a calendar. Mm -hmm. But I guess the moral of the story is, you know, um, there was an entity there just has, has done outreach to every, every resident in the region. So it's something maybe the town could think about. It's just um, putting together a flyer and, and getting it to all the residents. Yeah, or including it in something we already send out. Yeah. Like, you know, those news letters could have that every year, every other year, or something like that. That would be a good strategy. So um, I included a little bit of extra information on um, coastal, coastal hazards, four different categories, coastal flooding, coastal erosion, storm surge, and sea level rise. I pulled some definitions from the hazard mitigation plan here. Um, these pictures obviously aren't from Kennebunkport. I need to get to Kennebunkport during a flood. Um, to get some <laughs> some photos, um, but if any of you have photos that you'd like to share for the plan, we can um, incorporate your photos as well. No, no, no. Don't, I, uh, um, we've don't definitely we've definitely got some of those. Yeah, I liked this photo on the bottom. It was uh, during a a high tide event, and there's a you know a for sale sign and a for rent sign and. <laughs> Uh, the the mail truck driving right through quite oh, a bit of water, um, salt water to uh, to reach the end of the road there. So um, oh, that's why I like that photo. Um, and there's also there's a dead end sign too. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Got everything. Right. You can see um, you can see the driver wasn't paying for the car. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. The, the mail must go on, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that... yeah. Um. So the, the hazard mitigation plan does have a definition for coastal flooding, um, which is the temporary inundation of beaches and other land areas by the sea, uh, either, either as a result of coastal storms, hurricanes, uh, or erosion or landslides. And I included a map that shows um, the a couple different uh, FEMA flood zones, and these are the preliminary flood zones, uh, 2017 preliminary zones, uh, the uh, basically the the hundred year floodplain, and then the VE zone is is the um, the zone that includes uh, storm surge, uh, essentially the added hazard of um, storm waves. Um, and the green line there is just included as sort of a reference to show where the, mm -hmm. the normal high tide level is. Mm -hmm. um, there's no coastal bluffs or landslide hazards in uh, associated with coastal bluffs in Kennebunkport according to the, the state's uh, database from the main uh, geological survey, um, but there are uh, a few dune erosion hazard areas, and those are identified in red. A lot of them are uh, on the islands and um, a few along here at the end of, of Marshall Point uh, Road, and then along Goose Rocks Beach here, and the, the yellow and the kind of teal Stipple shows uh, the identified uh, dunes there. So not, I would say not a lot of um, erosion hazards as um, you would probably all be aware of already. Not a, not a ton of elevation change there. 
Whoops. Sorry about that. Just move my video screen here. Um, the next item that I developed a few maps for um, for sea level rise and storm surge. Uh, I know we've showed a few maps so far um, and gone over this data a couple times, uh, just in case there's anyone new on. Um, the main geological survey has uh, sea level rise scenarios that we have been using um, the data for um, in our maps. And those cover 1.2, 1.6, 3.9, 6.1, 8.8, and 10.9 as an extreme level of sea level rise and storm surge. And that is on top of um, the, the maximum predicted tide. And um, I have included the scenarios that um, the Climate Action Plan is recommending that municipalities plan for on this map. So that is the um, the highest astronomical tide plus 1.6 feet, which is shown in yellow, and 3.9 feet shown in orange, and 8.8 .8 feet shown in uh, magenta. So you can see um, areas impacted by these uh, sea level rise scenarios here. Yeah. And um, and then broken out just to get an idea of the acreage impacted at each level um, and the commitments by the um, Maine Won't Wait, the Climate Action Plan, um, suggesting committing to managing for 1.6 feet of sea level rise by 2050. So on that top map, it's the basically planning for what's shown in yellow. Um, to be sort of your new high tide. And there's uh, about 950, 950 acres that are inundated in that layer there. Committing to managing for nine feet of sea level rise by 2100 and preparing to manage for um, three feet of sea level rise by 2050. And then preparing to manage for uh, a higher level of 8.8 .8 feet of sea level rise by 2010. Uh, sorry, not 2010. We already experienced 2010, 2100. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can see the um, the acres inundated. Um, you know, based on just calculating off of these projections, uh, essentially double. Um, from that, the lowest level of management uh, by 2050 to, uh, to managing for a higher level um, by 2100. And we've, we've talked about this data, I know, and um, kind of looked at a little bit more in detail some of the road crossings and um, discussed some of the implications for flooding um, and they obviously go beyond the areas that are just covered by the um, the, the magenta and the orange and the yellow. Um, if a road crossing is impacted then that's going to uh, cause problems for a, a lot of other areas too. Any questions about this um, data display here? Yeah, so the, uh, the acreage calculation there, is that, so for instance, on that, uh, that first one, you've got um, the highest annual tide plus 1.6 and highest astronomical tide, that 147, is that land area that's between those two points or? The 947? Going? Yeah. Um, that is, um... That's a good question. So the it is, I would say, pretty close. Um, I used the the municipal boundary. So the uh, the highest astronomical tide plus one point six feet of sea level rise is clipped to the municipal boundary. Um, in that aligns pretty well with the high tide, but I could get those numbers too. Um, that may be a better way to display that. 
so that the yeah yeah, yeah I was just wondering if that was the land between those two points you know that's not the specific calculation um but I can do that and I think that would be I think that would make sense uh, when they're displayed this way um yeah I think that's a good idea so do they have one now where you have the average high tide and then the astronomical high tide and what that difference is? Yeah, that's what I was just thinking about. Yeah. Um, if it's worth doing, why don't we do that right. also? Um, so that would be basically, um, where did my mouse go? Um, so that would be what we have so, today. Right? Yeah, so I can use the this this high tide line that we have, the green, and then compare that to the astronom the highest astronomical tide. Um, so we can see if there is any, um, th there won't likely be substantial differences visible at a town wide scale between the, you know, the, the mean high tide and the highest astronomical mm -hmm. tide. Um, but, but there may be a difference, you know, in the calculation. Right. So we can add that in also. But it might be good to show from an educational standpoint that this is where we are today. Yeah. Right. And this is where, you know, we're planning where we need to manage for by 2050 and by 2100. That that is essentially what's shown here. Um, it just doesn't Between the show the blue and the yellow. Yeah, it just doesn't show the mean high tide, so like a normal high tide. Um, it shows the like the, the super high tide now. Yeah, but that's what the blue then, is, right? Yeah, right. and yeah. then the sea level rise is um, is one point six feet of sea level rise on um, on the the high high tide. Okay. But I'll add. Sorry, what? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, people are kind of familiar with the high, the highest astronomical tide in their areas of town. They know what it means now. So to see it on a map, to mirror what you see in your mind is kind of good. I like, you know, you can say, oh, this is what's happening in my neighborhood. I didn't realize over there. Right, right. You get the view yeah. of the whole town. We do Still have the here. data layers for um, the mean high tide and the mean low tide also, though, that were prepared, um, I think, by um, CAI technologies in the past. So we, we do have those two other layers. I think that if I zoom in on a certain area, you'll be able to see the differences. But at this scale, mm -hmm. it, might, um, it might just look like a lot of uh, squiggly uh lines um but i think that i think that Werner, your suggestion to change to recalculate based on um the difference between the the highest astronomical tide and um the additional uh acreage impacted by sea level rise um makes sense for this for this situation for sure um so i'll do that liz you mentioned this but i kind of was half listening, the commit to manage, that's from the state? That's from the, yeah, from the new climate action plan. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was going to comment on that too. Um, is you probably noticed a big difference in the state recs for um, the 3.9 feet commit to manage and 8.8 .8 feet prepare to manage. That's, that's huge. And um, the difference is what the state's recommending is you apply the, the latter standard to critical infrastructure, whereas the first one is for uh, you know ordinary um, land development. And I'm, at this point, it's just a recommendation from the Climate Council, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to end up being an administrative rule or perhaps even a state law. Okay, so you're saying the 8.8 .8 feet by 20. 2100 would be yeah. what you prepare your, your critical infrastructure to. 
Yeah, for example, your sewer plants, sewer, yeah, pumps, and that kind of stuff. Sewer is one thing you don't want to lose. Uh, whereas yep. if somebody's building a taco stand, you know, you can, you can hold it yeah. to the 3.9. And that's only if the taco mm -hmm. stand is expected to be around for another 80 years. Thanks, Tom. Um, and I can I can add that detail in too if um, if you'd like, or or maybe include that in the yeah. in the narrative portion. Yeah, it'd be good to, for the educational purpose. Uh, so we we talked a little bit about um, sea level rise and um, how that can exacerbate other hazards like coastal flooding. Um, but there is a few other uh, areas that I touched on. Um, one, the uh, the impact of warmer and cooler extreme uh, uh, extreme storm events um, are a risk to public health, and the the connection to hazard mitigation planning. Um, one of the the main connections is the need for identifying places for people to go to cool down or to warm up if necessary. And um, I was wondering if, if anyone had actually ever, you know, gone to a, a public facility like a library, for example, on a really hot day, if you don't have air conditioning, if you know where you would go if you needed to, um, or where you might send an, you know, an elderly parent if, um, if the, temperatures were extreme. If it's hot, you go touch the water. Go to the beach. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if you can walk down to the beach. Of course, right. yes. Yeah. Right. A pretty good picture there on the bottom, huh? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I've, I've noticed, you know, in these types of, you know, like on days where you've got extreme temperatures, uh, and I've certainly heard where a lot of folks wind up congregating is they congregate, you know, primarily in big box stores. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, those, right. you know, that's, that, that's where a lot of folks mm -hmm. will, you know, will go to, to seek refuge specifically on those or days. Or go to a movie. <laughs> right, right, right. In the sure. to, right, to cool if there off. are movie theaters in the future. To, right. Yeah. To, to cool off, but that's where you see a lot of folks congregate. I mean, the only place in town would be a library, mm -hmm. um, right? And it, is the is the elementary school air conditioned? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I know. It, I don't. I don't think yeah, it is. I so. You can see you get heat there if you needed. But... Right. Hmm. If it had. Um, if it had. If it had electricity. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Filling yeah, station. Probably... Uh, they've got a pretty good backup generator there to, yeah. at the at the at consolidated. Yeah. Huh. Village fire station was. I thought that used to be in the plan, the emergency plan. I know we had it as a command center, uh, but you could also at least put some people there. As a shelter location. As a shelter location. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's, uh, it's what pretty I small, heard... but but there's a kitchen and it's got backup okay. power. So yeah, so it could theoretically be used. Um, I yeah. heard that basically the Kennebunk Middle School is the um, is the site for um, yeah. you know, cooling or warming, sheltering. That's the designated yeah. location, mm -hmm. um, and it seems like the date that there really hasn't been a huge need for. Um, for housing, you know, a significant number of people in, mm -hmm. in shelters, but um, that certainly doesn't mean there wouldn't be in the future. Right. Yeah, um, I think the, the big limitation that I see in some of the buildings that we have in town, you know, with the exception of, you know, of the village station is that you don't really have, you know, public shower facilities. Mm -hmm. Right, and if, and if you don't have like air conditioning, for example, right. in the elementary school, that's not an ideal yep. location either in the summer. Yeah, I mean, the risk is certainly, given where we are, is 
greater in the winter time with loss of electricity and no heat and and with extreme heating events which are few and far between so far right yeah yeah, although places that are warmer more regularly, most people have air conditioning, whereas in the Northeast, sure. where, where mm -hmm. people don't expect uh, or don't have to endure that much heat, they don't often have the AC. Sure. Um, so there tend to be um, more folks impacted in, in the cooler areas when there are extreme heat events. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And extreme wind events, like we... Um, I don't know if you've been experiencing a lot of wind lately, but the New Hampshire sea coast has been hit by quite a few windy days recently. And this photo was um, from, um, I, I think it was right around our last meeting. Um, it was the last meeting. Yeah. I, I, right, it was I, the last meeting. Wow. Cause I, I, I texted Tom and asked him if he had power because his house is <laughs> nearby. My house is just on the other side of the Brick building, it's not brick building. Oh, uh, yeah. So this is this is my neighborhood here. <laughs> How it looked two two weeks ago. All all from one tree. The wind just took a tree down. And then the last item that um, yeah. that I I wanted to include in in this uh, chapter was just a a brief section on the pandemic, mostly because it also relates to. Um, it impacts to um, shelter capacity to an ex to a certain extent, as we've talked about in other meetings, um, the types of housing that are available and desired by folks um, in the future. And um, obviously this wasn't um, anything that anyone, whoops, sorry about that, planned for. Um, and the uh, uh, emergency management directors thought that shelter capacity would probably be halved uh, in the event of a pandemic. Um, and um, that the pandemic has particularly highlighted um, that um, communication from the state and the county to the local level is, in, is inadequate. And, um, and as a result, there's been um, confusion between um, who's in charge, basically. And I know that's occurred obviously down from the federal level to municipalities um, and that it has, um, it has slowed down the response to say the least to the, um, to the pandemic. So communication lines and thinking about um, who has the authority to um, to uh, implement testing, for example, and um, vaccines, et cetera, has, has been an, an issue that's played out across the country and I think it will be something that we'll all be continuing to plan for. The last section of the sort of brief chapter has a table, um, almost the last chapter section, has a table with some land use planning objectives that were included in the 2015 hazard mitigation plan. And I went through and looked at um, some of the ordinances and regulations to pull out kind of a brief summary of uh, what what's on the books, maybe what has been implemented in Kenny Bunkport. And I'm interested in your feedback on on these items um, and, and what I may be missing. So w one of the objectives is discourage future residential and commercial development in hazard prone areas. Um, and um, I think that's done primarily through um, the, uh, your floodplain ordinance. Um, another item is improve emergency evacuation routes and plans. And I did connect with um, Craig Sanford on that, and he noted that there are some evacuation signs that are posted. Um, Route 9 is considered an evacuation evacuation route, but it is vulnerable to sea level rise and flooding. And then as noted in the report that I mentioned, there are no established east-west routes. And 
Another objective from the plan is enact and enforce regulations that reduce the threat of hazard damage. And I pulled out um, some of the sections of your ordinance, the floodplain management ordinance, um, uh, prohibiting uh, hazardous off-season storage of items that um, that um, could become airborne um, or moved uh, during a wind event. Let me just move this window. Uh, regulations for construction, uh, all new construction additions and modifications to existing structures piers, docks, wharves, bridges, um, and flood hazard areas need to conform with the town's floodplain management ordinance. Um, some regulations on prohibiting variances when strict application of the uh, provisions of the ordinance create a practical difficulty if the project is located within or partially within a flood hazard zone. Is that a, that's a, that's an existing strategy. That is an existing item in your um, your um, land use ordinance. So that's on the books now. So Werner, how does that work with um, uh, you know from watching some planning board meetings over the years? Um, I've seen there was the period where we weren't building docks, and all of a sudden. We're building docks all over the place. Um, are they are they done with? I don't know anything about this, so I'm just asking. Um, are they are variances required each time they're done? Because I hear them discussed, or they're just part of a regular site plan improvement, and they're allowed if they get through. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good question. I mean, you know, docks are. I mean. Docks fall into a different category here. They don't require variance, um, you know. However, because you know, they're considered a water-dependent use, um, you know what you see mostly being you know, what you see being built around town are um, accessory, you know, residential accessory docks. Right. And uh, and the town does currently have a prohibition on any uh, on any new docks. Uh, going into you know what's mapped out as velocity zones, and so that's that's created you know some limitations in terms of the you know some of the areas in in Cape Corpus in particular, um, you know where there's you know velocity zones you know that haven't permitted new docks. The ones that have gotten in have all had to show that they were located outside of a V zone. Um, oh, I see. Which, which is I'm thinking really, of. I'm I'm thinking of one like on the pond off of Ocean Avenue a year ago, two years ago. So that wouldn't have been a velocity zone, so it would have been that's allowed right. to yeah. go in. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So there's yeah, there's the ones that have been, you know, that have been permitted as of late, you know, have all been, you know, in AE zones. Um, you know, and we have you know, we had we have had a couple that were Whenever you looked at the original flood insurance rate maps, you know those areas were shown to be in velocity zones, uh, but the property owners went through, you know, uh, you know, a very detailed study process, you know, with FEMA to study those locations specifically, and ultimately some of those areas, you know, wound up being. You know, based on the detailed studies, they wound up being taken out of the velocity zone based on the results of the study. Uh, but that's usually that's that's usually a multi-year process, you know, that takes to get that type of, you know, to get that type of remapping done. Um, but they basically have to have to prove that they're not located within a V zone if it's for a new dock. So if uh, it's for a new dock in a V zone. Are they allowed to grant variances, or you have to prove that it's not a V zone? No, it gets, it, it's it not even a, a buy off. Right, it's not a variance process. You have to, you literally have to go through a map amendment process. Um, and that's with FEMA, right? 
That's correct, yes. Should we state that in this? We talk about the um, construction, including all new construction additions and modifications to existing structures. Yeah. Gear stocks, warps. That's what's confusing me. So you're asking if we should include, sorry about the background noise. Um, so you're asking <laughs> if That's we okay. should include um, the a section on the process of um, going through a map amendment through FEMA if needed for a certain development project. Paul, is that? Well, I, I guess, I guess what Swerner's saying is you can't do it. You can't do a new dock in a V zone, period. If you can mm -hmm. prove it's not a V zone, then you could do it. It's not a variance. Uh, just part of your site plan. So, I, so if it's in a V zone, it's unconditional. You can't do it, no matter how much money you have or whatever. But if you can prove that it's not a V zone, and get FEMA to buy off, then the planning board can approve or Warner can approve. I don't know which it is. Yeah, for a new for a new dock, that's a planning board process. For the site for the site plan, and then ultimately the code office issues the issues the building permit. And that's that's not something, Liz. That's really it's not spelled out in ordinance, you know. So there's not like a process that says if this, then this. Right. Um, you know, because it's just specifically says in the ordinance, you know, that you can't put a you can't put a new dock in a V zone. Yeah. Uh, you know, but ultimately that is the process. You know, is going yeah. through and doing a map mod. Yeah. I, I mean, that sounds sufficient it, to me, right? That. So if I had a piece of property and I had an area and it's in the V zone, then I can look up on my own and find out what I need to do to change it or reach out to Werner and he'd tell me what I have to do. I'm not sure we, we would really need that in our, our comp plan per se. No, yeah, I was just no. under, right. understanding. Yeah, I think if it's, I think it was very clear if it's, if it's in the V zone in the ordinance, you can't put a dock in. So and yeah, that, I, I'm, that, I'm okay with that. that whether that's local law, not um, part of any FEMA uh, that, restrictions? That's, that's correct. So in, in this case here, the town has a stricter requirement that governs ex, that governs accessory residential right. docks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, so FEMA in and of itself, you know, doesn't prohibit uh, docks in velocity zones. Uh, you know, they just... The, you know, they just have a construction standard that you have to comply with, you know, relative to that. Uh, that's, a, that that's a local uh, restriction that we have built into the ordinance. So I think, I think it would be good that, that to have that, like, clearly stated, though, in this table. The fact that you do have a more stringent mm -hmm. local standard. Um, for as far as what what's allowed in the the V zone, so I I would I would add that in. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I think that that's fine to put that in because that's something that is spelled out in ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I mean I do agree with Dan. Like the other piece of it, like you know here's how you, you know here's, you know I don't want to say here's the workaround, but here's the workaround right. is that right. you no, know, I'm not you, suggesting you, that. Yeah. That that yeah. doesn't. That doesn't need to go in there, but I, no. I, I think it's fine. I think it's you know good to, yeah. to mention in there that the town doesn't permit new docks in velocity zones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, yeah, I think that's. I, I just get concerned about having text in here that's in an ordinance. I mean, I'd rather have this be. You know, sort of a higher level. The ordinance has the details because if the ordinance changes, I don't want it to not be consistent with this, right? If we say in here you can't have a dock in the V zone, yeah, right. What happens if we decide at some point in the future, you know what? You know, the the, the regimented well, requirements of FEMA are sufficient, and we're going to allow people to put docks in V zones because we want more access to water, or it would provide yeah. you know whatever it be. Then the next time you update your plan, you change it. The state yeah, but this, this is 10 years. And that's, and 
Like, yeah, but the, 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 the state says enact and enforce regulations that reduce the threat. And so what has the town done? And that would be one of them. Yeah, you're just, Dan, you'll just have to bring us back sooner. I, 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 you know, I'm okay with saying it's more stringent, period. And the details are in the, the ordinance. So I will say is, that we have added sections. This particular chapter is not um, even required by um, the, the state law. Um, there's yeah. no guidance in chapter 208 on hazard mitigation chapters um, oh. or specific items that need to be included in the plan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other chapters did include specific references to, you know, identifying um, specific uh, subdivision, uh, parts of the subdivision regulations, for example. So we do have this, I would say, this level of detail in some of mm. the other chapters. Um, uh, my thinking was since the town isn't involved in a super intensive process of doing the hazard mitigation plan, uh, since it's a county level plan, that um, kind of documenting um, how the town, where the town's at with respect to um, implementing some of the objectives is, is probably like a helpful exercise, if not for your comp plan, then for your hazard mitigation planning efforts in the future. Um, but to your point, Dan, I think having a clear, at least a clear summary that introduction to the table that explains, um, you know, what the table says, the fact that it's identifying current um, regulations right now and, and they could change is, um, is definitely important. Well, even if you just take these, I mean, these are all that, you know, these are all valid points here. You know, maybe they're, you know, maybe they're just referenced as, you know, here's a list of, you know, of items that the, you know, that the town currently does. And, and again, I don't know how big of a deal this is, but maybe, you know, maybe it's not as important to have the, you know, the chapter and article references uh, in there. You know, in terms of the specific locations, uh, mm -hmm. in the, you know, in the town code, and it just becomes like a list of here are some things that the town currently does, you know, in you know, in concert with this mm -hmm. particular objective. I agree. I don't think I don't think you need the chapter and article reference. Yeah. Werner, Werner how is the, oh. go ahead, Tom. I had a question for Werner. Werner, how has the uh, the prohibition on docks in the V zone worked out? Has it been controversial? Has it been around for a while? Um, yeah, it, you know, it it's been around for, you know, it's been around for a while. You know, I I do think very clear velocity zones. You know, honestly, a lot of those locations, I'm not sure how well a dock would survive. You know, just to begin with. You know, because you get some pretty, you know, you get some pretty hard wave action. You know, I think where it's been a little bit more contentious and difficult for people to understand is is when the velocity zone extends up into some of these upper reaches. You know that you know that are you know up into some of your your tighter tidal flat areas that you know you look at and you say, well, I don't know if that's a V zone or not. You know. Those are some of the areas that I think folks have had a little bit more of a difficult time kind of grasping, you know, um, you know, the, the point and the purpose. I mean, when we added that piece in there, it was, you know, it was a relatively simple purpose. And that was, you know, let's try to, you know, minimize, you know, the amount of potential, you know, construction debris that winds up being in the water, you know, during a storm during mm -hmm. a storm event, um, yeah, because in, in, you know, in my thought, it wasn't a matter of if it was going to get destroyed, it was when it was going to get destroyed. Uh, and let's try to prevent, you know, a fair amount of that debris, you know, showing up and, you know, potentially, you know, getting driven through people's homes. Um, so yeah, we'll walk. It, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, you know, in terms of how it's been, how it's been accepted. I mean, um, you know, some folks, you know, would would like for it to go away completely. 
you know, and, and others would prefer to not see any more docs show up at all. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, ultimately I think this, you know, the, you know, that piece of the ordinance has a, has a good purpose, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's, you know, you know, it, it's worked relatively well. You know, walk Goose Rocks Beach in the winter and see all, all the dock pieces, uh, decks, pilings, washed up. Yeah. It's a lot. I don't know where they're coming from, but. Probably some town that doesn't have this ordinance. <laughs> I think you get a I think you get a lot of pieces of stairs, you know, that wound up, you know, people's mm -hmm. beach, beach stairs that wind up getting getting for pumped sure. pretty hard. You know, a lot yeah. of that's what that's what I think we see for debris. Well, the couple other things I had on this um, this row of the table uh, included um, planning board's ability to. Um, you know, deny a site plan if the development would result in significant flood hazards or flood damage um, or is not in conformance with flood hazard protection re requirements um, and uh, permitting requirements for um, for improvements in the in the floodplain. Some of the other items that are listed out in the Hazard mitigation plan I wasn't um, uh, as familiar with, wasn't able to find, um, you know, a lot of these these answers in the ordinances and wanted to um, throw some of these points out to see if the Gross Planning Committee or Werner had um, any input on um, some of these objectives and the status in Kenny Bunkport and it's an item that we should consider for more um, public input, um, too. So, um, are you aware of what, if anything, the town has done to encourage owners of commercial properties and businesses to enact mitigation measures? There are sort of specific items called out in the site plan regs, for example. So I think it's, uh, I would say it's, it's tricky when to, to have the word encourage in there, you know, because yeah, yeah generally speaking, you know, uh, re requirements, you know, for mitigation med measures are, you know, are not often seen as, you know, encouraging, you know, for a lot of folks, it's, you know, it's another, you know, it's another requirement you know, that has to, you know, that has to be put into place and something that's you know, ultimately going to cost them more. Um, so I, I can, I can tell you something that, you know, we're actually currently in the process of applying for, um, you know, that, you know, my thought is that it would, you know, it would, if we're successful with it, it would meet, it would help meet that first, uh, that first sentence there. And what we're in the process of looking at right now is, um, you know, myself and a number of other stakeholders. And so when I say stakeholders, that's, um, that's uh, the state um, floodplain management office, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, NOAA, um, I'm sure there's a couple of other ones, but there's a there's a program that's run out of the Army Corps of Engineers office uh, called the Silver Jackets. And so we're in the process of working with the, you know, with the regional uh, Silver Jackets group, you know, and we're presenting Dock Square and Lower, and Lower Village as an area that we're requesting for a specific study uh, for to be done by the Silver Jackets team. Uh, and so ultimately, you know, what my, what my hope is, is that, well, one, I hope that we're accepted into that, you know, that, that that proposal is accepted into that program. Uh, ultimately what I'm, what I'm hoping that we achieve from that is that we'll have some really good guidance documents, you know, that we can, you know, that we can use to, you know, to help guide business owners in those areas especially as it relates to helping them figure out how to, 
you know, whether it's a dry flood proofing method or a wet flood proofing method uh, for these buildings, especially given the fact that they intersect with the real tight streetscape, uh, you know, in Dock Square, you know, and so in those cases there, you know, elevating buildings doesn't necessarily work unless you kind of bring the streetscape, you know, up along with it. Uh, so um, if, if that can fall, you know, that, that's kind of a, a look into the future in terms of something that, you know, we're currently in the process of applying for. Um, you know, I won't know until, uh, you know, I won't know until probably September, you know, whether or not uh, that, you know, that project is accepted. Uh, but if it is accepted, it'll be something that it'll be about a year long process. Um, you know, what it is is that Army Corps leverages, you know, a lot of their technical resources and a lot of their technical staff uh, to come into town to work on that. So it's a, it's a great opportunity and it's something that I hope that we, you know, that we're successful in getting. What does silver jackets mean? I, you know, I'm not really sure how or why they call themselves <laughs> silver jackets, <laughs> but, but that's the name of the group, you know. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's primary, it's through the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they're the ones that kind of spearhead these projects. And therefore, they're, you know, the end result is, is for what they call non-structural improvements. And so, now, most folks, whenever you say non-structural, you know, you think of a building, right? You know, but in Army Corps, in Army Corps lingo, non-structural means you know, the results of this are not going to be saying, hey, you need a dam or a levee or something like that. So in the Army Corps world, you know, a levee or a dam is structural flood, you know, flood mitigation. And so there, the, you know, these types of projects are, you know, what they considered non-structural. Um, so I, I, to be honest with you, I didn't even know the group existed until you know, I don't know, a couple of, until, I don't know, less than a month ago. So um, it, it seems like it's a, it's kind of an unknown group, but they, you know, they, you know, leverage their resources and they engage a, bun a bunch of the local stakeholders, of, you know, the technical stakeholder groups, you know, on the, at the state level, you know, and at the federal level to all come in. So, um, so we'll see, you know, we'll, obviously we'll keep the, you know, I'll keep the committee apprised of of our status you know should we be successful there great thank you how about um strict either stricter mitigation or um potentially development standards for key public facilities so is, is that a question about like i mean I don't know that the town necessarily has like a policy document, you know, that yeah. says, you know, um, and, and when you say key public facilities, are we talking like, you know, fire department, police department type thing or. Um, yeah, I would think so. Um, and this is, I mean, this is straight from the hazard mitigation plan. Um, so I don't have a ton of like background information about public facilities. Um, but I would say um, the, you know, police, fire, schools, um, libraries. Sure. Uh, yeah. Develop structured, you know, municipally funded prior, yeah. municipal buildings. I mean, I would say that, you know, when it comes to those types of pieces of infrastructure that, you know, I think as a general rule, the town is definitely going to, con you know, consider the locations of where these types of structures are going to go, you know, and, and look to the future to make sure that those, you know, that those structures are appropriately cited uh, and that, you know, that we're, you know, we're only going to put items, you know, that are necessary, you know, that have to be in those locations, you know, whether for some type of a functional use you know, for instance, you know, the town just rebuilt a couple of years ago, Government Wharf, you know, obviously, you know, the fishing pier has to be, you know, you know, by its very nature of its use is in a high hazard area. Um, but, 
you know, I, I don't know, like, I don't know we, that we have like a policy document for that, but I, I see it in terms of the, you know, just the planning that's mm -hmm. done. Great. And I think that kind of dovetails into the, you know, into the next question there as well. Yeah. You know. Right. We'll probably have to develop a strategy around that and identify, you know, what we want to target for. Yeah. Um, based on the, you know, feet above height, the hat. Yeah. I mean, I know that there was, you know, that there was some, you know, mitigation uh, work that was done around one of the uh, one of the sewer pump stations down on uh, Kings Highway, uh, the intersection of uh, Kings Highway and Dyke Road. You know, there was some. You know, this was probably 2012 when this was done. Mm -hmm. uh, that intersection, uh, the intersection of Kings and Dyke was was reconstructed, uh, was elevated. Uh, and then also there was some, uh, there was some flood proofing measures that were done for that particular pump station, uh, in that location as well. It's an, it's an interesting design for that intersection. I, I actually, I just, I re recently pulled the plan the other day, but when you look at the cross section, the engineers literally called the cross section of the road rock sandwich, you know, is what they called it <laughs> on the, on the drawing. Uh, but for all practical purposes, it's really what it, you know, what the, you know, what the underlying structure of that intersection is, it allows for, you know, allows for the, t t you know, for the tide, you know, the ocean to kind of go underneath the road and, you know, it has relief over in the ditch that's across the street from it, you know, so it's elevated, uh, but it also, you know, can still kind of flow underneath the road and come up in the ditch across the street if necessary. Cool. I like the rock sandwich term. Mm. Yeah, right. Mm. I was like, non-technical. Or maybe uh, it is a technical term. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know either. But I had to chuckle. I mean, that, that's the, the cross section. Rock sandwich one. Rock sandwich two. Uh, yeah, <laughs> great. Um, the next one uh, is, says use public funds to limit development of buildings and facilities in hazard prone locations. Um, I think this could be interpreted a few ways. Um, you could argue that, you know, using funds to develop your ordinances, public funds to develop ordinances is one way to limit development of buildings and facilities and hazard prone locations. Um, it's not specifically talking about uh, public public buildings and facilities. So, um, but I'm not sure if you have a recollection of um, any like recent uh, grant funds that were used for uh, developing uh, public facilities or buildings. Yeah, you know, hazard prone locations. It's in, it's interesting when I read this. You know, what I actually thought this meant was. You know, did we have any situations where we had uh, had done buyouts of property, and then you know mm. turn around, turn around, and you know deed restricted the property from being redeveloped? Um, Interesting. I didn't read it that way, but um, I guess it could it could be interpreted that way. Um, yeah, that's what I thought it meant. So I yeah, so we we haven't had any of those in town the, that I'm aware of. We don't just you know for you know to answer that question. Um, mm -hmm. The ones that I'm aware of actually were in there were some in Kenny Bunk uh, over on the Mousam River. There were a couple of a uh, couple of repetitive loss homes uh, along the Mousam that were bought out. In, in Kenny Bunk? Yeah. But okay. Yeah, we haven't had any repetitive loss properties that have, you know, that have hit that, you know, hit that category yet. Okay. Preserve. What, I mean, what is the advantage to a town to do that? 
Well, most of it, right. you know, most of the funds for that, Dan, you know, aren't, mm -hmm. you know, they're not town funds necessarily, okay. you know, like they're, you know, most of those are federal funds that are used, you know, for those buyouts. Um, I think practically speaking, what's happened is that it, it's properties that have, you know, wound up, um, you know, where FEMA's had to pay out, you know, numerous times over and over again on flood insurance policies. Right. You know, that that's what triggers the uh, repetitive loss designation. And so they basically then wind up saying, well, we're just going to buy it out as opposed mm -hmm. to, okay. um, you know, as opposed to paying to rebuild it again. Yeah. So it's federal money and then it gets turned over to the town, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It either gets turned over to the town or or it's just, you know, it's a they, deed, res deed restricted. Deed restricted. Piece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what are the benefits depending on, you know, how many properties are are bought out in one area if you um if the if a town is repeatedly paying to repair um a road for example that's been damaged by storms and by buying out properties you're able to discontinue the road or not have to elevate a road that's that's one yeah. area okay. where the municipality could benefit and if you if you were to buy out um you know a, lo a larger area of quite a few properties then there is potential to develop some um, more flood storage capacity with undeveloped land than um, land that has houses and roads etc so that's another area where um, you know you may not be really quantifying the dollar value of of that benefit but it could provide um you know act as a buffer to other properties and reduce damage to other properties and um, municipal infrastructure what one problem i've um had with this type of approach is there's really no future for it because as the sea rises the number of houses that get impacted will, will you know increase exponentially so it's it's kind of like an experiment at present time. We, okay, we can afford to buy out a few here and there, but where do the numbers start adding up when the sea goes up? You know? Yeah. I mean, I can. I mean, I could see. I mean, what you said would made some sense, but I can also see if there was an opportunity by buying it out, you ended up with a place where other people could at least use it for the time being, for uh, putting a boat in the water and that kind of stuff, have water access for the public. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and that's. I think in those areas, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I do think those areas, it doesn't mean that they don't get used necessarily in that sense, yep. but you know, I've, I've seen of those areas, they wind up do get in some cases used for more water dependent type uses to yeah. turned into like, you know, recreational areas or, you know, to your point could be a boat launch, you know, yeah, we have to circle back to that that shoreline access issue again, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, two, the last two birds. Couple, sorry. Yeah, that were good. The last couple items here: are, uh, preserve invaluable cultural and historic resources in hazard-prone areas. And I think Tom, you touched on this in the historic resources chapter. At least some some um, recommendations. Um, mm -hmm and uh, enc encourage property owners to undertake uh, vol voluntary mitigation measures. Um, are there any, um, I, guess, I guess I would think about any uh, educational um, or, or messaging that the town has done um, to, uh, to encourage this. Yeah, I mean, we certainly, you know, I mean, we certainly, I, you know, we spend a fair amount of time in terms of, um, you know, education with folks as they undertake, you know, as they undertake projects on their property, uh, you know, in terms of what the reg, you know, what the regs are. Um, you know, I think what I've found, you know, in, you know, it's not the property owners don't want to do stuff, right, you know, in terms of things on their property. Uh, I think what, you know, I think what there is somewhat of a need for are options, you know, are, are, you know, a kind of some guidance in terms of like easier options that property owners can do. Um, I've, 
what I do see is that whenever you create a process, whenever you have a, a regulatory process that's onerous, you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't have the flavor of encouragement associated with it, if you know what I mean, you know. Um, and so I think, you know, whenever you talk about how, you know, how do you encourage somebody to do something, you know, there's usually, you know, you know, one, you're, you're usually giving them options and ideas that are going to be attractive and they're going to be, you know, relative, you know, are achievable for them, you know, and you're not necessarily holding it to them as a, as a strict requirement, you know, um, you know, those are some things. On, on the other hand, if you do have things that, you know, that you real that you want people to do in terms of, you know, a regulatory item, you know, it helps if there's, you know, if there's some type of, you know, carrot that goes along with the stick, you know, so to speak, you know, um, you know, I think that that's, you know, that, that, you know, that's how we've, you know, that's how we've approached it with, you know, with folks, you know, in, in the sense that we spend a fair amount of time with them, you know, trying to help them, you know, realize, you know, some of their goals and at the same time, you know, encourage them to do it in a, you know, in a resilient fashion, you know, that's going to protect their investment too. Yeah. I know that's, that's kind of tough to sort of put into, you know, put into a policy and a status, you know, because a lot of it is just, you know, it's, it is, it's, an, it's informal, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I guess it's making sure that you have, you know, making sure that your departments and that your staff have the resources to, to educate themselves, you know, on these things, you know, making sure that, you know, you know, making sure that we've got, you know, the ability and access to, you know, to classes and, and things like that, uh, you know, to gather this information so that they can pass it on to folks. So, good point, Lauren. What, what's your assessment of, you know, the current status in getting up for it in terms of staff? Are they, they pretty much up to speed or could, could they use, use some more? Well, you know, it's, I, you know, I, I can, I can, only you know speak for my you know my group of folks that you know that work with me on a regular basis and you know in the in the codes office codes and planning and you know i think we've got a really good group of folks you know that have you know have a good level of experience in terms of in the trades they're you know they're an intelligent group in terms of you know being able to grasp you know the con you know the concepts and and they can communicate it well to people as well in, in, you know, in English, you know, so that it's not so sometimes overwhelming or over overhead sometimes, you know, and, uh, and that's, I don't think is always common. You know, we try to, you know, we really try to encourage folks, you know, the staff to be accessible, you know, to the public to help them, you know, help them through processes. Um, you know, so I think, you know, I think we've done, you know, I think we've done fairly good, you know, I, I mean, I do think that, you know, as, you know, as regs continue to increase, you know, and, and as, as, you know, things continue to get a little bit trickier and a little bit more complicated, you know, it adds time to processes. That's what, that's what I see, you know, it adds time, it adds, you know, you know, it adds another, you know, another layer. Um, you know, in particular, where Goose Rock Speech is so heavily, you know, and densely you know, developed in terms of homes, you know, in, in the dune areas there, you know, once we get through, you know, once we get these, you know, new flood maps adopted, you know, it's going to add another, just a, you know, it's another regulatory layer on top of, you know, on top of permitting, you know, that's already complex because you're already, you know, in a lot of cases dealing with, you know, this, um, you know, the state and federal, uh, agencies sometimes depending on where you're at, you know, so it's going to add another layer, you know, of process to it. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, you know, it can be a challenge keeping up on all the, you know, on all the changes mm -hmm. and make, you know, making sure that you don't, you know, inadvertently set people up for, you know, frustration. 
I think one challenge, Werner, I've heard from like landscapers, um, you know, is, you know, owners redevelop a, a property and they want it to look like this. And that may mean, you know, putting in a big lawn uh, and taking out the uh, grasses that were there forever and, you know, toward the water side. Um, you know, so there's a bigger area without mosquitoes and, you know, all of that has the impact of, you know, losing uh, areas that protect us all. Um, and while you see that, you know, if you dig into the nice books the state puts out, you kind of get that. But I think the landscapers could benefit from some town uh, official you know, guidance that sort of addresses a number of issues. You know, you don't go into your office and get a brochure on, um, you know, native plant species that are going to, you know, do this, that, and the other thing. Um, so it, it would seem to, you know, I don't know where the right place for that is, but, um, you know, on the whole you know, the whole resilience thing, you know, it's going to be more and more of an issue. Mm. Um, yep. So I think, you know, landscapers I've talked to who, you know, are mindful about this, some will do whatever, but some, some who are mindful are like, well, I don't know how to tell my guy that this isn't really a smart thing to do here. And that's what they're, you know, that's what they have in their mind's eye. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I I hear I hear what you're saying. You know, a lot of times it's difficult for, you know, it's difficult for the contractor to say something to their client, you know, that they maybe know that they should say, uh, but they're in an awkward position to say it. Yeah. yeah. So like a best practice is kind of, you know, whether right. it's, yep. whether it's uh, brochures or, or events or, you know, uh, YouTube's or, you know, something. Mm -hmm. So there's a resource you know, the, the state, the new state book or whatever it's called that I, you know, the one that was just updated has a lot of materials in there, but it's, you know, it's 50 pages long or 100 pages long, and I don't think you can get homeowners to go through it. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's what I, you know, whenever I talk about, you know, you know, making sure that you have, you know, that there are options, you know, for folks that are attractive options, you know, that they you know, that work well, for sure. you know, right. that, that they can buy into. And it's not that hard of a, you know, it's not that big of a stretch in, you know, in the other direction and gets them, you know, and gets them away from maybe what they were traditionally thinking, you know, that, that they were going to expect in their landscape. Right. I think that would be a good thing to think about where we could kind of plug something in related to um, not necessarily going as far as recommending a like a policy for sustainable landscaping, but adding a little bit of just a little bit of content in in one of the chapters on um, on that topic. Um, I think is is a great idea. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think that's. Uh, you know, that's, you know, there's, there's a need for some supportive language, you know, on that, you know, in the plan somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, was that something that would make sense, you know, like in the future, there's just a section of our town website that has sustainable ideas. Yep. Yeah, that would be a great shared, strategy. Right. The, you know, how you should take care of your lawns and landscaping and wherever yeah. else we it's actually it's something that the con you know the conservation commission i think was was working on some of that okay. you know, mm -hmm. a, a number of years ago um but you know it's, it's probably good. something that would help to have some you know sure. encour encouraging language in the plan that you know that kind of prompts and and spells that out sure yeah and uh, there's definitely you. some some tools out there to encourage um almost like lead development for landscapes. Um, so there are some, there's some good models uh, for 
that can be used to help um, either you know create a resource or um, provide some general standards or um, like metrics for kind of evaluating what mm -hmm. makes a what makes a landscape quote unquote sustainable and resilient if it's coastal and resilient yes right. So um, just one last slide here. Um, I know we have a couple other things to get, get to tonight. Um, I just highlighted a couple of the tools. Um, I know we haven't been getting into uh, strategies too much in this sort of first round of drafts, but um, the Georgetown Climate Center has um, a lot of resources on um, climate adaptation and managed retreat and, and other areas, um, and topics that we've talked about tonight, um, and a couple of the tools that they highlight for reducing future development and redevelopment in vulnerable areas are overlay zones, um, setbacks and buffers, which I know um, that you're, you're all familiar with overlay zones and have setbacks and buffers, um, conditions on development permits, which you're doing, um, and then um, one item we haven't talked about as much is in encouraging soft armoring techniques instead of um, building up hardened shorelines, um, like walls, for example, um, to, to mitigate uh, sea level rise impacts. So I just called out a couple of those. And I think that is my last slide. Does anyone have any questions before I stop the screen share? Anything to go back to? I'm good, thank you. No, I'm good. Thank you very much. Yep. Great job. Yeah, I agree. Good chapter to have, even if it's not required. Okay. So that would, not hearing any questions, I'll say we can move on to number three, which was our winter public outreach. So um, I'm back. I will um, <laughs> pull up, oh shoot, where did it just go? Hold on, I just had this showing. Um, let me just pull up. A couple of things. I'm going to have to switch screen back and forth in a second. Okay. Um, but uh, does everyone see the PowerPoint? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. See if I can get it in slideshow mode here. So um, I exported the most recent survey, mini survey, um, two results and um, wanted to just quickly bring those up on the screen. Um, so I'll go through those questions briefly. Um, first, uh, 50 people responded already, um, and I think it's only been posted for about a week. So um, that's pretty exciting. Um, everyone said they had responded to um, the first survey. Uh, this is really difficult to read. I don't know why this printed out so small or exported quite this small, but um, uh, the question was, how would you rate your access to, uh, and then the top, the top set of uh, bars is docks and boat launches, um, places to land small uh, watercraft beaches, and then places to uh, sightsee and take in scenic water views. And um, I'll just put these numbers up since that first slide isn't especially clear. Uh, most people responded to this question and um, uh, the the uh, I would say most most positive uh, the very good um, rating was highest for places to sightsee and take in scenic water views mm -hmm. uh, uh, followed by access to beaches um, docks and boat launches and um, places to to launch kayaks or paddle boards was uh, uh, rated. Uh, um, the, the lowest. Mm -hmm. Are those results surprising to anyone? Mm -mm. No. Oh, no. You know your community. <laughs> oh, okay, and um, the other the other answers were open ended, and um, I'm going to just share another screen quickly because there were too many responses to. 
to really use that wordle that I the word cloud that I used last time mm -hmm. to show you the responses. So I'm just going to kind of pull this screen up pretty quickly and um, I can zoom in a little bit more. Um, question three was well, where would you like to have dedicated pathways for bicyclists and pedestrians include both roadside locations and places that are not alongside existing roads? And the responses were pretty variable. Um, some folks thought that, um, that the um, existing routes were decent. Um, some like, for example, respondent seven said almost anywhere would be an improvement from almost none today. <laughs> Um, there were quite a few on Route 9, um, areas of Route 9 between um, hmm. Cape uh, Port, which I'm guessing is down by the center of town, somewhere, <laughs> yeah. center yeah. town and Cape Porpoise, and then along um, Sandy Pines Campground to Dyke Road, um, North Street. Uh, Goose Rocks Road, Beachwood Main Street, North Street, School Street. Um, so I, it might be interesting to see all these on a map, um, uh, which I didn't get to doing. I just exported these today. I was actually surprised there were so many results already. Um, traversing the port, I thought that was a, a, a nice example or a good answer. A few more for North Road, School Street. Um, someone added in they'd like to see a small skateboard park for kids um, at Fireman's Park, which I think is um, a nice, a, a good to know, um, not necessarily related to bike paths. Um, and then King's Highway um, area. So I can email these results out if folks are interested in seeing like the full list of preliminary results, um, or we can wait until we close the surveys and then provide summaries at that point. Um, you can just let me know what, what you're most interested in. Um, and uh, question five was, um, what types of recreational and cultural facilities would you like to see more of in uh, Kenny Bunkport? Um, Pick a wall area was noted, uh, picnic grounds, sledding hill, um, walkways or paths to facilitate a loop, um, which kind of aligns with the first question a little bit. Um, more indoor space, someone said more open space, some more programs, some are, some are sailing lessons, for example. Um, and your menu for. Uh, Ooh. Theater and musical performances. Let's face um, it, it's a cultural desert. That's amazing. <laughs> Culture, yeah. <laughs> um, you really feel. Someone <laughs> thought <laughs> there were good activities for kids and grandkids, um, but not in the winter. Um, a couple more on local local theaters, hmm. plays and performances. Thanks for doing these. I don't think you can call it a mini survey if you have to read 23 pages to answer the question. <laughs> That's a fair point. How is it 23 pages? Um, what was 23 pages? I think maybe they actually went, so we included a link on the top to go to the uh, right chapter. Oh, there you go. Um, if they wanted to know about what coach, cultural and rec resources were, and so maybe maybe we got someone to go to the right yeah. chapter. Um, so that's a success. Um, more open space, water space. Um, more parking for beach access, that sort of thing. So a variety of, of responses here. And um, I would say once we wrap up this well, survey yeah. and close it, we'll organize the results. Um, so it's a little bit easier to kind of wrap your head around what folks provided input on. Um, sure. But I thought there was a really nice diverse mm -hmm. list of responses to this yeah. question. So. That's good. I like I like the um, you know go go scroll back up one. There was one that kind of caught my eye. There is the uh, to the dread dredge a canal connecting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Further up with the signal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very creative. 
<laughs> right. Hey, yeah. That's, oh, that's it's creative for sure. Yeah. yeah. That wouldn't that wouldn't create a stir at all. <laughs> no. Oh my god. Um yeah, imagine if we included that canal on our like our transportation maps. Right. <laughs> right. Um right. So, so those were um those were the responses to the two open ended questions. And right. um I think next time we'll um we'll talk about um additional questions for um for the next mini survey. And thank you for helping with the um getting the links out through the town's website and listserv because I think that's really uh generating a lot of responses. Mm -hmm. So, so that's it on the survey update for now. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Yep. Any questions, yes? Okay. Uh, so hearing none, number four is review of minutes from March 2nd. So uh, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion to pass as written. I'll second. Any discussion? There are none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Hands raised. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Okay. Next up is growth area map. Where do you want to lead us through this? Yeah. Sure. Let me. Uh, let me back to that email. Pull that up. So, uh, so as as you all uh, probably recall. You know, we generated uh, a policy uh, that we reviewed. Gosh, I think we reviewed the final draft of that a couple of meetings ago, uh, mm -hmm. in, in which uh, growth planning, you all as a board could, you know, do an occasional review on, you know, some of the places where we've seen uh, either water main uh, or sewer main extensions. And, you know, you uh, have, have some developed kind of questions and criteria to look at where those, you know, where those extensions have occurred, you know, and you could uh, take the opportunity to decide whether or not any of the uh, growth areas on the growth area map needed to be modified based on the presence of, you know, of that infrastructure. Uh, so to that, uh, to that end, uh, I sent out a, uh, a memo to you all uh, that had a number of different things on it. Uh, it had, you know, one, it had a table that showed where, uh, you know, what the numbers have been in terms of um, growth permits, in terms of which, uh, you know, which, you know, which areas where they've been uh, issued. So the the data is a little bit limited in the sense that we've only had the the growth transition in rural areas since 2013. Uh, so that's the extent of the data that we have uh, for that. And then I also included, uh, included you know, the growth area map uh, and then identified the two areas you know, where we've seen uh, utility uh, extensions. So uh, one of them that, that's been constructed and that's uh, Binnacle Hill phase two, uh, which that subdivision, you know, extended uh, the sewer, you know, it's on, it's on sewer uh, where they extended the sewer main and also extended the water main uh, within that location. And then I also just in, I included uh, the, um, you yeah, the Heritage Woods subdivision, you know, that was recently approved. They've just started construction uh, that will have, you know, a small main extension to it. Um, where is yes. that, Werner? Heritage Woods? So Heritage Woods, it's uh, it's the old skating rink parcel on Main Street oh, okay. between, uh, you know, up by the police department. Is this the trust, the housing trust? The, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I just included that in there just as a, you know, as a matter of, you know, reference. Right. Right. So, uh, and so what we did, you know, within the process of, you know, the, yeah, committee's charged to take a look at these things every two years. Um, you know, uh, so you, you have the data uh, from some of the past, you know, some of the past years in terms of you know development and permits. 
Uh, and, and again, to that end, I reached out to both the water district and the sewer district, you know, for the information that I passed on to you all. Uh, so you have uh, the questions uh, that, you know, if you'd like to go through the questions that are in the policy, uh, we can go through those, um, you know, and then consider whether or not any of those areas, you know, should be redesignated. Um, you know, as a practical matter, uh, you know, Heritage Woods uh, is already in a transition zone. And so it doesn't, you know, there's, there's, not really much of an effect in terms of a modification of that, you know, of that mm -hmm. particular piece one way or the other, but. It's not exempt it's, because it's affordable housing. I thought we had, uh, I forgot our exact language. Um, there's something in there about it's exempt from being counted towards the permits. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so it's, it's not included in any of the data because none of those permits have been issued yet. Okay. No, but but they're not. They wouldn't limit anybody else's. That that's correct. Yes. Yeah. 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 This, yeah they wouldn't. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't have a have an effect on anybody obtaining a growth permit. Right. And that and that's in the growth zone, right? That's the last parcel. Uh, I believe it, it's or, in it's in transition. It's in transition. Okay. So it just, uh, okay. It looks like it's in. Looks like it's in growth, or mostly in growth. Looks like it's in growth. Mm -hmm. I love beige, mass, but, not. But maybe it's not. Not yellow. If you got the right one circled, Werner. Yeah. Let me let me just pull it up here. No. Oh, yep. Excuse me. You're right. It is the very last one there. It is in the growth zone. Growth. Yeah. So there's yep. so there's really no need to do anything with that one. There's there's no need to do anything with that one. Yep. It's right on the it's right on the kind of edge cusp there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's really the Binnacle Hill phase two. Uh, do we want to consider making a change there relevant, similar to as we did with Binnacle Hill phase one? Correct. And that it be transitional versus rural. Correct. Okay. Looking at our permits, uh, we're nowhere near our growth number of 40, right? So there's 20 growth and 12 transitional and eight rural, right? Currently available? That's right. Every year? That's correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, we haven't, uh, we, we haven't really, you know, we haven't budged off of the uh, you know, off of the, you know, the minimum 40. Yeah. And it looks like we've only maxed out the rural three times. And we uh, haven't we, right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and we, we had, haven't, we haven't maxed out transitional or, uh, or growth. Yeah. Yeah. The one that, that hits the most in terms of the activity and the ones that we you know, where we run out of growth permits, you know, first is in that, is in the rural area. Sure. Which, you know, whenever you look at the map, I mean, it makes sense, you know, in, in terms of whenever you look at the, you know, whenever you look at the land area, you know, that it makes sense that that one, that that area maxes out first. Where's the limit numbers, Dan? What's that? Where's are the, the, are um, the limit for I, each for each area listed in this document? Uh, that's right. I mean, it's uh, right now. It's it's uh, twenty, uh, twelve, and eight. That's what I was looking for. I couldn't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So half of half of the permits go to the growth, and then it's what twenty five percent to transitional and the balance to. Well, no, that's not right. It's twelve, so it's thirty uh, percent. Yeah, let me. Let I think me it's thirty percent it. transitional and twenty percent rural. Twenty percent of forty would be eight. So yeah. So, yeah. So that's how that's laid out. Um, and the idea behind it is, if you hit, you're also supposed to use the uh, what the hundred ten percent of the average of the previous ten years. 
to sort of set the new number for a year, but uh, but never dropping below 40. 40 so you can yeah. see we've never had anything that would even come close to that at this right. point. Yep, we don't need to deal with that. Right, and in, and in that uh, where you pointed out, Paul, you don't take into account uh, permits for affordable housing. So, so just to give you, yeah, just to give you a sense in terms of, you know, the num, you know, the last time that the town had, you know, what I would say was a significant spike in terms of, you know, the number of dwelling units, was the, the year two thousand and two, and so you ha you had seventy nine growth permits that were issued in the year two thousand and two. Holy cow! How could that happen? So, is that is that my development? I live in High Point. High Point in the Foxbury Woods. Yeah, that's right. That's what it was. It was a combination of you had Foxbury and High Point, you know, mm -hmm. more or less being developed at the same time, and that that was before the growth, you know, the growth um, section of the ordinance had a, I think, had a cap, had a number, oh, you know, set in it, uh, which at that point in time was then re. It was adjusted i think to uh in 2005 i want to say or four it was at uh 48 and so you know you had uh yeah 2005 uh, there were 47 you know that were issued and then and then it dropped pretty you know dropped off pretty significant significantly since then so 20, 29 in 2006, 25, 23, and then 2008, you know, I mean, that we had a, we hit a bit of a recession there. And so 2009, for example, was probably the lowest year. Uh, and that was, there was only 10 that were issued, you know, that year. But. Okay. So if we were to look at that parcel, and want to make it under consideration, not that parcel, but that area. What does it really change? I mean, you know what, um, you know what happened the last. To... What happened the last time is that you know, you know, you you run into the into the situation that you know because the lots you know because lots are individually sold. Mm -hmm. That you know that that particular subdivision, you know, being in the rural area, um, you know, could you know could essentially take all the growth permits, you know, for a you rural. know for a year for rural, mm -hmm. um, you know, could you know and could you know subsequently also affect you know the availability of growth uh, permits for other properties even for the next year, mm -hmm. um, because of the waiting list. Right. That that yeah, that's correct. And so that's uh, that's a situation that we ran into, uh, not last year, year before, um, you know, where we had, um, you know, where where we had some folks who uh, weren't able to get growth permits in other areas in other areas of town. Okay. Uh, and that happened relatively. I want to say that was relatively early on. You know, I think it's one thing if you know. Um, you know, if, if growth permits kind of tend to peet, you know, tend to peter out or run out towards, you know, October, November, you know, it doesn't right. typically create a hardship then, you know, for the mm -hmm. issuance of something in January, um, you know, but whenever, you know, whenever you start getting ready to run out of them and, you know, in April, you know, April or May, then, you know, that uh, those tend to have the potential to create a hardship for folks. Okay. So if we look at the questions, right, is uh, what is the development potential of the affected parcels? Well, it's all laid out there right now, right? In that picture, if we zoom in on that. Yeah, it's just the timing. It's only a timing that, question at this point. That's, that's correct. It's, right. just a it's just timing at this point. They've all, yeah. all been approved, right? That's yeah, correct, that, yes. And that big parcel uh, with, uh, within that circle, there's a big parcel of land sort of contiguous uh, yes. next to all the little homes. Is that open space? So that, that's, yeah, that's the open space piece. 
Okay. So we're not going to be building there either, right? No. Right. Do you, do you, Dan, do you want me to pull up uh, the so GIS? Pull... You want me to pull yeah. up the, G, the GIS yeah. map? That'd okay. be great. Uh, Just so we. Yeah, could I see mean, what right... we're looking at. You should drive down there and see what you're looking at. It's kind of unbelievable in some respects. <sighs> because, of the, because of the topography in the hill, it looks mm -hmm. like you have four story buildings behind. Houses that are, you know, I'm glad I don't own a home on, uh, like the Weewall home on uh, off of New Bitterford or the Miller home off of uh, off of uh, Henshi Way. All right, so so can everybody see? Uh, the mm -hmm. GIS map screen. Okay. So this is uh, what we're looking at here. This is phase. This is phase two, you know, of Binnacle Hill. Uh, and this particular piece that you're looking at here, Dan, which is I think the one you were asking about, is the is the open space parcel. Okay. So from a development potential, there's no, I mean, all the development's been approved. That's there's correct. No other, there's no other development. Yeah. Okay. The B, what is the effect of placing the affected parcel on the, on other properties relative to the growth permit allocation? That's what we just talked about, I assume. Yeah, right? so I think we're, yeah. So if we put in a transition, it opens up rural for other uh, permits. Does the reclassification of the affected parcel continue to ensure fairness in the allocation of building permits between subdividers and single lot property owners? I guess I would argue that it does. It, it makes more uh, permits available. Uh, does the reclassification of the affected parcel create a situation that would facilitate a rapid completion of a major subdivision that could outstrip the town's capability in providing municipal services? Well, they've already been approved, so that's already have been looked at. I would expect that. Yeah, yeah, that would yeah, be like that'd be a situation if you were looking at, you know, say for new. instance, like sewer capacity, right? Yeah, if you right. were looking at a raw piece of property. Right. Like if we were adding, you know, another five or six parcels going to the east, right, to the Where, west. How is, how is, I mean, I saw that there's a huge bond issue that we're facing because of sewer. How much of that is um, related to max, maxing out of capacity? Um, it's like $20 million. What's the number? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. It, uh, I don't recall what the number is, but it's not a it's not a capacity it's not a capacity question. Uh, a lot of what you're looking at in the bond is is aged out infrastructure. You know, so it's just you know a lot of those component pieces. You know, you have you know pieces at the treatment plant that are that are nearing the end of their their you know their useful life. Uh, back whenever you know, major improvements and, and, you know, these pieces were put into play in the seventies and the eighties. And so that, that's what a lot of what's, you know, what you're seeing in the, in the bond is related to, you know, pump stations and uh, critical infrastructure pieces at the plant itself. Uh, it's not a, it, you know, at the end of the day, you're not, you, you know, you're not creating uh, more capacity at the plant per se with, uh, you know, with these, uh, you know, with the bonds. Yeah. Because if it were, I would say, you know, people are selling properties for huge amounts of money. And yet the rest of us are facing higher taxes as a result of infrastructure. And if there was a correlation between that, I would think an impact the, uh, you know, I sold the lot 10 years ago and it, I got a hundred grand for it. Now I could get 400 grand for it. I have a lot of money in my pocket. Um, somebody's got money in their pocket. Maybe there could be 
an impact be to to help mm -hmm. the rest of us out who, you know, weren't so lucky. Um, yeah, I mean there there is a you know there is a connection fee you know whenever a property first hooks up the sewer you know that has to be paid, um, but yeah it's it's not a it's not a question of you know we're running out of capacity and so we have to you know we have to build an expansion, yeah. uh, you, you know it's you know it's a question of you know replacing you know equipment that's just nearing the end of its lifespan. Your, your system is fifty years old, much of it is. Yeah. Right. Hopefully, part of that will be okay. how we make it resilient too. Hopefully, we're not uh, they're not ahead of us too far. Um, okay. Uh, does the reclassification negatively impact the town's growth so that the annual increase in population cannot be adequately served by community facilities as those services are needed? Uh, unlikely. Unlikely. Uh, and the last is, is the reclassification of the affected parcels consistent with the town of Kennebunk Port's comprehensive plan. Well, it's consistent with what we identified for uh, extending areas based on sewer and oh. water. Yeah. Right. Um, and we've kind of went through these questions and we seem to not have one that would negatively it would go against this rule. So I would propose that we take that area that's circled on those specific lots and move them into the transitional zone. I'll second world. that. Okay. Any other discussion on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. I'll um, I'll I'll make those modifications to the map, and then you know get an updated updated version to everybody at at some point here. Okay. All right. So that was growth area. Next steps. So we got two things under next step: update from SMRPC on climate and resiliency projects. I can speak to that. Okay. Um, we, Liz and I have been in communication with two uh, two people over at Southern Maine um, Planning and Development Commission, who are whose work is focused on um, sustainability and resilience in the coastal communities. And they've uh, we invited them to come to a growth planning committee meeting. They uh, they readily accepted. Uh, they're very busy, so it's it's taken a little while to, to find a date that um, everybody can make it, but April 6th works for everyone, so they'll be on the next agenda, and they'll be speaking for approximately um, 30 minutes. It's Abby Sherwin and Karina Grater. And following that discussion, Liz and I were going to um, start the conversation about the state's new climate action plan, because it's going to have huge implications for, for every municipality in the state particularly along the coast. So um, we will get that conversation going on April 6th as well. And um, after we had uh, after we secured uh, the visit from Abby and Karina, they, they let us know that they'll also be um, holding a, a online uh, webinar on very similar uh, subject. I'm gonna hold up kind of if you can see it from here. Have you guys seen this flyer at all yet? Is it, whoa. Invisible. No, there's invisible flyer. No, I see it. What's going with that? I don't know. It's very <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looks like a in with magic there. mirror. Yeah, I don't know how that works. Yeah, but anyway, so I'll tell you what it said. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're gonna they're gonna be discussing a lot of these same subjects. It so happens it's just coincidental. You guys could have been first, if not for the scheduling um, difficulty. But on March 29th at two o'clock p.m., they'll be discussing the same topic um, online. Zoom session, and they'll be joined by a couple folks from the Maine Climate Council, my, Brian M. Brett and uh, Dr. Cassandra Rose. So the four of them will be, uh, be uh, giving you a little preview. So the, uh, all of uh, York County and beyond will be getting their session on the 29th, but you'll be also getting personalized attention on April 6th. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. But uh, I, 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 you know, I met Brian 
couple occasions, and he's, he's very knowledgeable. So if anybody's looking for something to do, March 29th at 2 o'clock, we can send you an email with a with an attachment. Is there yeah. a reminder? Werner, well, I so think it would be a good idea to send a, uh, you know, a notice out, and then it could go to the trust mail list and the, you know, the various mail lists in town for both of those dates. You know, put them, package them together on one. One's our event, and one is, you know, more general. Right. Um, given that we're still in COVID, I think we'll get people to go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And one's daytime, one's nighttime, so that's good. Yeah. yeah. You know, Tom, if you've got that readily available, that notice in an email, you know, um, oh, you know, if you could box tomorrow morning. Yeah. That way, awesome. I can just, yeah. I can just grab that. Um, okay. In in um. I have one other item I wanted to share with you. Um, at the last meeting, you asked me to uh, reach out to our counterparts in the city of Biddeford, which I did, and I had a great conversation with the planning director. You recall that the subject was uh, coordinating the municipal efforts uh, mm -hmm. from Biddeford over the Little River. Right. And, uh, I got a very enthusiastic response. They would they would love oh. to get something like that going. Um, and they uh, said that the uh, Benefit Conservation Commission would be a great place to start. So we're, we're starting to make some connections there. And, and uh, right. the planning director, Matt Eddy, he's familiar with these, these intermunicipal um, entities because um, part of his career he spent in the town of Kennebunk. And so he's familiar with the, uh, the Kennebunk River Committee. And he, he thought that worked really well. So um, I didn't have to explain anything to him. Um, that should. Right. Yes, I hadn't. Yes, I hadn't realized he went over to Biddeford. I knew. He, I knew he wasn't in Kennebunk anymore. But yeah, yeah, I didn't realize it either. I was uh, until I was chasing down this little river thing. I said, "Whoa, well, I know this guy." <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, in his in his enthusiasm about the little river, suddenly he starts going on about the vernal pools. So I've been to see the vernal pools. I said, "Well, no, I haven't yet." So there's another there's another topic where you guys uh, might might have some common ground with the city of Biddeford that uh, you know for for conversation. Yep. Thanks, Tom. That's hey. great. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll, what I'll do, I'll um, I'll forward Matt's uh, email he sent me a follow up email to, to all you all of you so you see exactly um, uh, what he said and then who is who is proposed contact is in the city. Mm -hmm. Tom, did you happen to um, mention the aquifer? I didn't. I that didn't. was another another question we had. If uh, you know, what did it? What did it for? I guess just an outline of, of their priorities and how they handle. I my words are are not here. I don't know what no, I'm no, saying. No, I get it. But no, you know what? I, it's in my notes. I'm sort of. No, that's I'm, great, Janet. That's a great idea. Um, yeah. And, and and judging by the enthusiasm I encountered, I I think. You know, it'd be easy to get a conversation going on that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Just to say you finished it. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll take a motion, Jim. Uh, Hi, Jim. Jim. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Hey. Aye. Hey, thank you very much, Tom and Liz. Warner, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Liz. All right. All right. Good night, all. 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 Good